Hi, everybody. It's Lydia from the Oneness Junkie podcast and YouTube channel. And today I have an exciting guest. I'm so curious to learn what all he knows about the topic that we're going to be talking about today. And for any of y'all who have been listening to any of my other episodes, you know that the Oneness Junkie podcast is really focused on personal healing and personal growth. And the reason that I'm doing that, aside from highlighting people who are doing work to help the world be a you know much better place, I see the connection to the practitioners who are helping with the healing that helps the individual become more of who they are meant to be. And when they get to that place, they become happier. In my opinion, that creates more compassion, more um, acceptance and tolerance in the world. And really, I think um, I say, when you heal yourself, you heal the world. And so that's why I have Jonathan on the show today. So I'm going to let him introduce himself, but he is Jonathan Schechner with the Vital Point Podcast. And before he introduces himself, I'm just going to share that I like to mention if I know previously or if I don't know my guest. And today I do not know Jonathan, so I'm going to be getting to know him with you on this call. But um, we did have a pre-call and I got to meet him and talk about what we wanted to bring to the audience today. And I think it's a really important topic that actually a lot of people are kind of curious about because I think that it's not really well known what he, what it is that he has to share with the world. So Jonathan, do you want to introduce yourself and give us a little background about yourself? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Lydia. Uh, my name is Jonathan Schechter. I'm a breathwork facilitator and uh, integration and transformation coach. And um, yeah, so there's a lot there, right? Um, and I think we we had talked about kind of starting about like how I got into this work or kind of how I got here. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles uh, and I had kind of like my first spiritual experience right after um, my grandmother died and I watched her I was with her when she passed and um, that in itself was kind of a spiritual experience and then the next day I was in a bookstore and I I never read any sort of nonfiction. I, at the time I only read fiction books and I was still like feeling this presence that I had you know kind of experienced and felt since her physical body passed. And um, I was raised Jewish, um, but I was in this bookstore and I felt this presence like actually physically stop me. And it was telling me, you need to go down this aisle. And I was like, okay. And I didn't know what was happening, but I went down this aisle and it was, it was like the, the aisle of spirituality, you know, spiritual books. And it led me directly to this aisle with uh books about buddhism and i picked up this book and like it was like it was like a magnet like drawing me to this particular book and i picked it up and like the first thing that i read was you know buddhism is about experience like don't just believe something because anybody tells you even if it's the buddha you know go and experience it for yourself and then you will you'll want to continue to practice because you've had this direct experience yourself. And that led me into meditation. It led me into, you know, further into exploring Buddhism. And within uh, a couple of years, I ended up uh, going to Tibet for a year um, to study uh, Tibetan and to teach English. I ended up um, living for most of that year in my main uh, teacher's monastery at about 13,000 feet, uh, no running water or electricity, and just in a very like holy spiritual place um, and really amazing place where like you didn't really have to even try to meditate so much. Like as, you know, as, as soon as you sat down and started to pay attention to your breath, you would just 
drop into this like really deep place just because of the energy um, and the other practitioners that had been putting that energy into, you know, that area for, you know, at least a thousand years. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and uh, so the other thing that happened when I went over there um, before I ended up going to the monastery was I met the woman that I would end up getting married to. And that's a very important part of the story, uh, especially for like where I am here in terms of a breathwork facilitator and integration coach. Uh, when I came back to the States, I ended up coming to Arizona. That's where I live now in Tucson. And, um, you know, continuing that relationship with her, we ended up getting married. And over the course of the marriage, um, she started to have some um, sexual trauma from her childhood start to come forth that had been, you know, suppressed by medication and just, you know, things like that aren't always known in our conscious mind. And uh, she didn't really know how to handle it. I didn't know how to handle it either. I didn't know how to support her. And things started to progressively get worse. She started to have seizures. Uh, and it was interesting because we were going to all these doctors and the doctors would say, do you have any childhood trauma? And she would say, no, because that she was wasn't aware. Right. Yeah. That was, that was true for her, you know, and uh, it ended up, you know, I'm, I'm advancing the story. I'm trying to condense, but uh, she ended up trying to commit suicide because um, she really couldn't handle what was happening. I didn't know how to handle that either. Uh, we didn't talk about it for over a year after it happened. And uh, in the aftermath of that, uh, our relationship continued to kind of get uh, strained. She started to drink a lot to try to kind of handle what was happening and um, started Just to cope. Yeah, right. Trying to cope. But in as a part of that. <laughs> She also started to become very uh, abusive emotionally and sometimes physically towards me. Um, and I really didn't know what to do. I didn't have any resources outside of my meditation practice. And to be completely honest, I had let that meditation practice lapse a lot since that time living in Tibet. You know, I, I was um, working as a retail grocery manager and I was trying to work on music and sort of had like a very had gone back to kind of like a quote unquote, like normal, you know, normal life. And so I really didn't have any resources to to deal with it. I didn't know how to leave. Um, I definitely knew I wasn't happy in the situation. And I ended up going back to, into therapy after uh, marriage uh, counseling didn't really pan out. And um, I also rededicated myself to my meditation practice. And within a year of those two things, I ended up leaving um, the marriage after, you know, really trying to, to reconcile. Yeah, you did work. everything you could. I did, you know, and, and one of the things that I learned uh, was how to set boundaries. You know, like that was something that wasn't necessarily modeled very well uh, in my family growing up. Right. So or I just kind of thought not only model, but probably taught. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I just kind of thought that I had to stay there and stick it out and got to the place where I said, no, I have to, I have to leave for, for me. And when I left, um, you know, even though I felt like, okay, um, here, here's this abusive situation I'm, you know, decoupling myself from and, while I feel like I didn't deserve that, I also have to take some sort of responsibility for being the other person in this relationship, for staying as long as I did, for um, you know being part of this dysfunctional relationship. And so there's things that I need to fix within myself if so that for the very, you know, at the very least, I don't end up, picking the same type of a partner. You know, I don't want to end up in the same situation again. Yeah. You can see the signs more quickly now. Yeah. So I really went on this sort of this journey of self-discovery and personal development, you know, kind of at my lowest. And um, 
one of the first things that that happened that sort of kicked off a lot of other things that ended up growing and blooming uh, was I had the opportunity to work with um, a type of psychedelic medicine called 5-MeO-DMT, um, wow. which comes from the um, the Bufo. It's a Bufo, um, like the Cal Colorado River toads um, that live um, native to um, to Tucson and the Sonora, Mexico area. Wow. It's uh, one of the strongest psychedelics known to man. Um, it's very, very powerful. And do they grow wild? Just you can go out and find them out. Yeah, during during the monsoon season, um, you can actually, you know, if you know where to go, you can go and and find them. But I, you know, I found a practitioner uh, that you know was skilled in kind of guiding people through um, through this journey, and it was right at this the beginning of me saying like, okay, I, I need to I need to find these ways to to help and and to change. And so I was starting to get involved in ice baths and cold exposure. And I was definitely meditating and journaling and, um, you know, starting to go into sweat lodges. And I, I had had several very transformative experiences with, um, with, with mushrooms and with some other psychedelics in more of a recreational way. But it had, had this big impact on me. And so one of the things that um, that I was kind of keen to to look into, like I was curious about was was ayahuasca. And so um, but really the the five MEO experience kicked off a lot of this stuff. You know, I, I ended up uh, I, I feel like it opened the door energetically to a lot of other things. Can, yeah. wait, can you, I mean, yeah. I know you're in your intro, but can you just mm -hmm. explain to the listeners who have no idea what you're talking about? That's yeah. a big word, what mm -hmm. you described of that mushroom. Can you just mm -hmm. explain what a psychedelic is and how it affects you? And then we'll continue with your, where you're at today. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, psychedelics, um, I mean, obviously there, there are things like LSD and, you know, ketamine and things that are coming from a more chemical basis, but the majority of psychedelics are plant-based and they're really, there are medicinal plants or substances that have been used by different indigenous uh, cultures for, for thousands of years in order to open themselves up to, to spirit, to open themselves up to an expanded state of consciousness. And as we're starting to find out with, uh, with neuroscience and, you know, modern, uh, you know, being able to test and see what's happening in the brain, there's actually um, neurogenesis, neuroscience, uh, neuroscientific things that are happening within the brain when we ingest these, uh, these sacred molecules and work with them in an, an environment that's safe, that we prepared ourselves for. Um, so it's, we're in an interesting time right now where, you know, like a lot of people, when they think of, you know, psychedelic mushrooms, for instance, um, they, they may have had like an experience in high school where, you know, maybe they went out into the woods with some friends or, you know, they were at a party or, you know, going to a concert and, and had some mushrooms and, you know, they, maybe they saw some colors or, you know, everything got a little bit giggly um, this isn't really what I'm talking about. And it, one of the things that I do with my clients is, um, help prepare them to work with these substances in a way that's therapeutic. And one of the main ways that we do that is by really focusing on set and setting. Um, if you start to get involved with anything around psychedelics, you're going to hear these two words, um, frequently. So setting obviously is like the external environment where you're taking it, um, what's around it, what, what's, what you have kind of prepared. And then set is your mindset. So like, how, how are you approaching this uh, experience? And then I actually like to talk about a third set. And this is something that I help my clients with it, And the, that third set is uh, the skill set uh, that you bring to the experience, um, things like mindfulness, like breath work. So skills that you can have 
so that when you go into these experiences, you can stay as grounded and present as possible so that you can work and regulate your nervous system because oftentimes, especially if you're working with, um, with these substances for, for healing, there's, you know, there's energy that's stored in our body and it's going to come out. And that's not always the most comfortable thing, regardless of the modality that you're using, right? Like uh, if you're going into a sweat lodge for healing, if you're um, doing yoga for healing, you know, you may, it might have some emotional kind of um, material coming out. And it's definitely something that, that comes up with, with breath work, which we'll get into as well. Uh, so yeah, having these, having the, this tool belt, this skill set of different things that you can use to regulate your nervous system to stay calm is another really important thing for for doing this work. Yeah. So bring us to the point of where all of that background brought you to what you're doing today. Yeah. So um, like as I started to kind of sit in these ceremonies, um, one of the big things that kept coming up was integration. And, um, you know, well, what is integration? Integration is making two things whole, you know, bringing two separate things together. So as you're working with these different uh, medicines, you know, you're, you're in an expanded state and then you have to kind of go back to your normal life. And, you know, what I saw other people and I actually experienced it myself was that you come off of these oftentimes very blissful experiences where you have a lot of insight. Um, you, um, might've seen certain things that you, oh yes, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. This is what I need to change. You know, it's very clear in the experience. Like insights. Right, right. Or or downloads, or you might have visions that really show you very clearly, this is what needs to change. And you come out of the experience, like fully energized and like ready to do that. And then you know, you go back to work or you go back into the relationships, you know, that you're around that aren't necessarily like serving this new vision that you want, or, you know, you go back to eating the same way, you know, you have, everybody has habits and behaviors that we've kind of built up. And, um, part of the reason that we have those habits and behaviors is because we're trying to cope with things, you know, in, in our own way. Right. And so there's this very frustrating thing that happens to a lot of people. And I would see it where that, that clarity of those visions or the, you know, the insights that they got start to fade. And then all of a sudden they found themselves back sort of at square one, you know, and maybe they're like, okay, well now I need to go back and sit with, you know, have another psychedelic experience. And if that happens, you're just kind of going on this hamster wheel, right? <laughs> and so um, integration is the practices that help you kind of break out of that hamster wheel. It's like, how can I take those insights, those visions, those things that I saw that I wanted to change and actually bring it into the rest of my life? Right, the awareness. Uh, right. So, you know, one of the things that, Uh, I was blessed enough to kind of be exposed to really early on in this process was breath work as a form of integration. And I was very skeptical about it at first. Um, Actually, when I was a teenager and starting to get into, uh, you know, drugs and different psychedelics and getting into a lot of trouble, my dad tried to sit me down and and tell me about breath work. And he, you know, he said like, yeah, you know, I know what you, I know you think, you know, what you're doing and that you're, you know, exploring these new, you know, realms of consciousness, but you can get just as high doing breath work as you can. That's amazing that your dad knew that. Yeah. He, so he, he practiced a type of breath work called um, rebirthing with Leonard Orr. Um, And he had done that, you know, unbeknownst to me since before I was, you know, before I was born. And at the time I wasn't ready to hear him. I was like, oh yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. Right. Um, But this thing started to come up again in my consciousness of like, oh, you should try breath work. It's really, really good for, for integration, for continuing to explore um, this work. And so I said, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. 
you know, what's, what's the worst that can happen. Right. And when I started doing breath work, um, I literally started to have these very psychedelic type of experiences, but in a much more grounded way, you know, like when, if, if you take mushrooms or you take ayahuasca, you're, um, you're sort of giving, you're, you're giving that time away, like where you can't like say like, okay, I, I changed my mind. Like, you know, let's, let's just stop now. Like this is too much, right? You're kind of on this roller coaster for, for hours and hours and you've got to be there and deal with it. Whereas wait, before, how long does it last for those of us who've never done it? Um, I mean, depending on what medicine you're working with be, between four and eight hours. Even. Okay. So, so yeah, it's an it all be, day thing. Yeah. It can be a, it can be a long, a long time. Um, you know, with breath work, you can be in this very expanded state that's very, very similar to uh, like a psychedelic. And if it gets too overwhelming, you can just bring your breath back to normal. And within a few minutes, you're you're back, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's very accessible for people, you know, not only that maybe are concerned about uh, the legality or the safety um, of working with with these different uh, medicines, but also like to introduce them to that expanded state. And I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, the neurogenesis and the neuroscience. So one of the things that's coming out right now in terms of the research that's being done, and if you've, uh, if you're familiar with Michael Pollan's book and now Netflix series, uh, how to change your mind, he, he talks about this when somebody takes, um, you know, a psychedelic and, Similarly, when they do this type of breath work that I facilitate, uh, one of the things that happens is that the part of the brain uh, that we call the default mode network, which is a part of our prefrontal cortex that um, is in charge of, uh, you might say the ego, like you might call it the ego. It's, it's sort of our sense of self. It's how we think about ourselves in um, autobiographical memories. And also when we think of ourselves, like when we project ourselves in the future, um, that's the part of the brain that's like lighting up and kind of in control of that. But when we work with these um, substances or when we do breath work, that part of the brain quiets down and there's less activity going into it. When that happens um, from a breath work perspective, there's, uh, we all have an inner healer, an inner intelligence that has a chance to emerge um, with um you know, if, depending on the sort of like wisdom tradition of the psychedelic you're working with, they might talk about like connecting to the spirit of the plant. From a neuroscience perspective, what these two, what these things are are that are happening is that as that default mode network quiets down, we actually have the opportunity to make new neural connections in the brain. So a neuroscience is showing us that um, after you know around thirty between 30 and 40, our neurogenesis, making new neural connections, new neural pathways, basically grinds to a halt. And so we're not actually like making new decisions as much as we're just going with the, the perspectives and the neural connections that we've already made. And Unless you're like making a conscious effort to change your neural network, right? Right, right. So, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, um, we're sort of on autopilot unless we are consciously trying to to change through things like meditation or breath work um you know or you know like you're saying making a conscious effort so literally we can create new perspectives um you know new perspectives pop up into our consciousness that we never saw before because we're making those new neural connections and like if you look at the research that um like johns hopkins um has done on psilocybin on 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 mushrooms they literally have like these um, these brain maps where they show before and then during the mushroom experience. And there are exponentially more neural connections happening, um, you know, after and during uh, the mushroom experience. It's why, um, you know, psychedelics are being touted as um, treatment for things that traditionally have been kind of challenging to work with, like addiction like depression, PTSD, um, people with, you know, anxiety, um, because they've got, you know, their, their brain is sort of wired in to these certain neural patterns, these certain neural, um, connections that, you know, the, the landscape of their mind. 
Yeah, and then I when, would also call that survival. You know, they 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 mm. linked up in order to survive whatever it was they were dealing with. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that so when when we're when we enter these expanded states of awareness through breath work or psychedelics, we're actually giving ourselves a chance to create new growth to like step outside of those survival patterns that we've been wired into. Because not only is that happening in the brain. It's also like it goes from the brain into the body, right? Into the nervous system. Um, and it, so we're, we actually have the opportunity to, to step outside of, of those experiences and create new, new ones. Um, and so it's, you know, when you like watch Michael Pollan's uh, Netflix, for instance, you know, there's a, there's a gentleman on there that, you know, had OCD, like really strong OCD for his whole life. He had this one um, you know, mushroom therapy experience and, you know, completely broke out, um, you know, was completely able to change the, uh, the OCD for myself. Like, um, you know, when I left my marriage, I, um, uh, drank a lot. I was about 40 pounds heavier than I am right now. I didn't eat very good. I smoked uh, pot every day. All those things were ways that I was coping with my emotional baggage that I was carrying around from childhood trauma, um, you know, complex trauma. My parents got divorced when I was four um, to some things that happened to me as a teenager to the things that I couldn't deal with in the marriage. And so there was this organic process that happened um, because as I started to take care, better care of myself, I started to say, well, maybe I shouldn't drink. Or maybe I shouldn't, you know, eat a whole pint of ice cream, uh, you know, for, for, for dessert. Right. And I can relate. That's why I'm laughing. You know, so you, you have these thoughts of like, oh, you, you know, like this isn't good for me. Right. But then what, what's challenging for people is that they try to change and like the, there's something that's sort of fighting back, you know, and that can be really frustrating. It's like, Hey, how come, how come I can't change this? It's well, the path of least resistance, right? Yeah, that you right. end up going back to. Yeah. And it's, the, it's because your, your nervous system and your mind is wired with these survival and these coping mechanisms. Like this is how you've learned to soothe yourself. So, you know, one person soothes themselves through um, gambling, another one through, you know, sex and, and the relationships that they get into. Another person is, you know, drinking heavily or, you know, using heroin or, you know, yeah. o different opiates. Anything it's that's all coming from, yeah, it's all coming from the same source, which is this like internal pain and that the, we've learned, oh, this soothes the pain. So like, as I started to remove those ways of soothing myself, it was almost like, I felt like I was thawing out, you know, and all of a sudden there were emotional things coming up. Um, things in my body, somatic, um, you know, things as well as things that I needed to like work through with, with a therapist and having tools like breath work, like, um, doing ice baths, you know, um, journaling, all the things that I work with, um, you know, with, with my clients on, like to show them like, Hey, here's, here, here are these different ways that you can rewire these systems that you can create a more, um, positive, environment for yourself that you want, you know, that, that's going to help you create the, uh, the effects that you want, the changes that you want in your life. But, you know, I had to, I had to experience that myself. I was like, oh, okay. It's not just as, as simple as like, cool, I'm just going to stop drinking. Now I've got to deal with what are the things that I was sort of suppressing with, with the drinking. Right. And so it's a and, process, you know, and you're, you know, like I said in the beginning, you know, you're healing yourself in order to yeah. help others because that's like your calling. Absolutely. And so now you're let's get to the let's talk about what you're doing today, because this is a worldwide broadcast and mm. on the Internet, it's worldwide. So can people work with you through Zoom or through the telephone? Like, how can you work with people if people want to work with you? Yeah, definitely. Um, so for both my coaching and my breath work, um, I do work online with folks. Um, you know, if, if they're local to Tucson, you know, I do have some in-person clients, but the majority of them um, are 
I've connected through the blessing of the internet, you know? Um, so in terms of breath work, um, not only do I have private clients, but I run um, group online breath work uh, a couple of times a month. And I then, saw that you have one coming up on October 1st, right? Are you full or do you still have registrations available? Yeah, there's still have reg registrations available. Um, we'll keep it uh, limited just because I want to have uh, an environment where I can support people. And there's only so many people that I can support at one time. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, but yeah, so it's right now I'm running that um, the second and fourth Sunday of, of every month. Um, but yeah, you can reach out to me if, um, you know, if you want to learn more about how, that. How or do they reach out to you? Um, probably the best place is my Instagram. It's uh, Blue Magic Alchemy. But um, I also put my website on, you know, your show page information. It's um, it's beacons.ai backslash Blue Magic Alchemy. Um, so yeah, if you see, I, I mean, like I have Blue Magic Alchemy is my brand. So, you know, there's a Facebook page, there's Instagram. Um, I actually have a, like a full website that's um, actually being developed right now. So possibly by the time this airs, um, you know, it'll, it'll be up. Uh, but yeah, Blue Magic Alchemy is, is where you should find it. And me. people can actually go to your podcast and listen to you on a regular basis. What do you talk about on your podcast called The Vital Point Podcast? Yeah, so The the Vital Point is all about methods for um, personal transformation. So we talk about psychedelic integration. We talk about breath work, meditation. Um, we've had some ice bath folks, somatic therapists. Um, but really, you know, the, the vital point is with all of this is that regardless of the method that you're using, you actually have to practice it. There's this great, um, like one of, one of my, uh, favorite Buddhist texts, there's this great line in it. And he says, it's, is it appropriate to blame the doctor if all you do is read the label of the medicine, you know, so it's not, it's not enough to have the medicine and just look at it. You actually have to take it. You actually have to do um, the work. And like you, you know, like you said, and like, like you're focusing on with this podcast, you know, as you heal yourself, you, you know, heal the world around you. And that's one thing that I've really found with the, with the podcast is that even though these people that I'm talking with are from a variety of different modalities and backgrounds and practices, the thing that we have in common is that we've all gone through some sort of um, awakening ourself. And then there's like not, it's not a choice. It's like, well, now I have to help share this with somebody else. You know, like I have to pay it forward in some way. So I feel that way, which is why I have my podcast, you yeah. know, because, because, but what I want to do is I'm not actually the practitioner. I want to, provide all these different practitioners in a showcase so people can handpick who they want to work with, who they resonate with. And yeah. I, I find that, you know, the work that you're doing to help others as a practitioner is making the world a better place, right? Yeah. You're absolutely. helping people heal. Absolutely. And I, you know, for me, like I've, especially since, you know, I only went through, this journey myself, like a few years ago, um, there's, there's no lack of information, uh, in the world right now, you know, like I'll, I'll use, I'll use Buddhism as an example, um, within Tibetan Buddhism, which is like the main thing that I practice. Um, there, there are unbroken lineages, you know, from the Buddha to this student, to that student, you know, that you can trace, right. When Buddhism went to Tibet, it, came through india and there there are these lineage holders these people that traveled across the himalayas from tibet to india it took them multiple years they risked their life and they would come back with a few teachings you know maybe a couple of things that they found they would go look for a teacher it was this incredibly arduous process now i can literally open my phone and within a second, find those teachings that took them years and they risked their life to find. So the, the world has changed in terms of the 
uh, access to information that we have. We have access to so much information. We have access to all these different modalities and teachings and traditions and things that you can use to, to heal yourself. So therefore, if that's the case, why are we not all like healed? You know, it's not, it's not the, it's not the lack of information that we, that we, that's the problem. It's like, people are like, okay, well, what do I do with this? You know, and I know for myself, when I was starting out, when I was poking around and going, well, maybe this is the answer. Maybe this is the answer. What about this? You know, I was exposed to a lot of things, but a lot of things didn't help me. It was actually hooking up with somebody, you know, going through a breathwork program where I could dedicate myself to, you know, months and months of development, um, working with a coach, working with, um, you know, a somatic experiencing practitioner and like finding people that had, um, you know, the experience that could help me not just give me the information, you know? So it's like, kind of like the, the difference between like, you know, you can, uh, you can go buy all the ingredients for like a cake, you know, and try to do it yourself. And, you know, it might come out good, you know, especially if you find like a good video on, on, on YouTube or something like that, right. Some instructions, but if you're working with a master chef, you know, somebody that has years of experience, how much better is that cake going to be? You know, yeah. it might take, it might take you time and time and, you know, practice, practice, practice to make anything where you're like, oh, this is, this is what I was going for. Right. And, you know, uh, you know, you might end up like in an I love Lucy type situation or something where you're adding salt instead of sugar or, you know, the ratio is bad. It, the cake doesn't rise or something like that. Whereas if you're working with a, with a coach, with a, with a teacher, um, you're able to kind of shortcut a lot of that. I stuff. call it fast tracking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tim Ferriss talks about that, you know, like in terms of there's, there's one way of learning and that's like the 10,000 hours, right? We've all heard that from Malcolm Gladwell of like, it takes 10,000 hours to master something. Well, that's true. And if you could find like a master teacher, how much would they be able to like fast track you? You know, how much would you be able to learn from their experience and them saying like, well, hey, this is the mistake that I made or this is what I learned as I went through this particular process. So, you know, you don't have to uh, make the same mistake that you, you know, would would be doing over your 10,000 hours. And certainly you still have to do the work, right? You can't just rely on the teacher. But my experience has been like that working with a coach, working with a teacher is, um, you know, however, however that relationship feels right for you, um, you know, is, has been like the way that I've fast tracked or kind of leveled up, um, you know, and that's, that's been a lot of my journey this year, you know, like I, two years ago, I was do, trying to do everything myself. I, you know, it's like, okay, I want to figure out how to start a breathwork business. Um, I want to do X, Y, and Z. And it wasn't, you know, I was trying to do that all myself. Like I was trying to figure out how I could get what was in my head and what I was practicing on my own and scale it out to people. Well, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough that I found, uh, you know, a breathwork program, like a facilitator training program that I really resonated with. And I went through that program. It was six months where it's like, here's how you do it. Okay, great. Now I don't have to like sit there and stumble through all this myself. And then this year it's like, I've, hired a business coach. I've hired a personal trainer. Um, you know, I've hired somebody to help me with my website instead of, um, my, one of my survival patterns, which is like, I don't trust anybody to help me. I can only rely on myself. And so I'm going to do everything myself, even if it takes <coughs> four times as long, you know, it's a, it's a, the, the website is like such a great example because there are things that I've stumbled through that have taken me eight hours to do. And the professional that I hired that knows what he's doing can do it in two hours, you know? So it's like, oh, wow. Okay. This, it really is worthwhile asking for help. Yeah. And, it's you know. speaking, speaking of that and in wrapping up, um, one of the things I've always said is, you know, when you go on a tour of the Amazon, you know, river, for instance, do you want to 
go with someone who's been there before, who's actually, you know, been through the waters and knows, you know, the experience, or do you just want to go with a guide that's read about it in a book? Right. You know, so when you're selecting your coach or your uh, support therapist or whatever you want to call them, um, you know, I always think it's more valuable to actually find someone who went through the pain and mm. suffering themselves because they they know, you know, what to, how to guide you into what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot yeah. of people that are jumping into this this. Um this kind of our arena right now in terms of psychedelics and integration coaching, um, you know, as, as these, you know, like the FDA is fast tracking mushrooms and MDMA, um, the legal status is changing in a lot of different places. And there's a lot of people that are viewing it. I was just talking to somebody yesterday that was talking about how um, sort of the same experience that happened when cannabis started becoming legal. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are jumping into it for, for money or seeing it as like, oh, this is, this is a, a opportunity, a revenue make, generator, right? A, a quick, quick revenue. And, um, for me, that's not necessarily who I want to work with. You know, like you said, I want to work with somebody that has the experience that's gone through it. Um, uh, not somebody that just like, you know, jumped in it for, for other reasons. Yeah, yeah, to add it in their tool belt, right? Yeah. Like, oh, absolutely. I can help these people. It's oh, it's all the same, you know. Right. But I don't really think it is. Do you have anything that you want to share as we wrap up and close out this episode? Um, no, just uh like I said, um, you know, you can go to um beacons.ai backslash blue magic alchemy or you know, look me up blue magic alchemy on Instagram, Facebook. Um I do have uh, you know, a six month coaching um, container that I work on w people with one on one, um, as well as a shorter breathwork coaching uh, container. It's right now it's uh, six weeks and, you know, it's the scope is much more narrow in terms of like what we go over, but it goes into all different types of breathwork because, um, you know, I think we could have just talked about breathwork for, for this, for this show. It's become such a popular thing and you know wim hoff who is one of the most famous breathwork folks in the world right now like has a reality show and has been on gwyneth paltrow's netflix what show. is that what where's the reality show is it on netflix no it's it's on cable uh oh. somewhere yeah i i, I like don't Bravo have it. or something yeah i think so i don't i don't have cable myself so i don't I'm, either I'm limited to to netflix but yeah i was you know he's he's been on uh you know, Gwyneth Paltrow's Netflix show. And uh, I, I feel like at least once a week, I see some sort of news story or magazine article about the benefits of breath work on CNN, on Newsweek, on all these different, um, you know, types of, of, of formats and forums. And so, uh, you know, what does that mean? Like, like I said, breathwork could be a, a whole nother podcast in itself because there's all different types of breathwork for different reasons and different intentions that you're trying to get out of it. And um, so, yeah, that's that's what my breathwork coaching uh, container is all about. It kind of goes through the different stages of breathwork. Can work. people go to your podcast and find old episodes where you talk yeah, about Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're, I think I've got about 45 episodes that are um, published right now in the process of um, recording some new ones at the moment. Are you on Apple and Amazon? Yep. yep. All the, all the major um, audio. Spotify. Yeah. And I just, I just started um, moving things off of Instagram onto YouTube. So if you search for blue magic alchemy on YouTube, um, you can um, find the new episodes there, but yeah, anchor Spotify, Apple, Amazon, um, just look for the vital point. And there's, yeah, lots of, Lots of information about breath work, um, about meditation, uh, about psychedelic integration, and a whole lot of other things kind of in, in the middle of those like somatic practices. Well, I can tell you have a lot to share and a lot to, for people to learn from you. So y'all head over to the Vital Point podcast and learn more about what Jonathan has for y'all to learn about the experiences and the support that he's offering those who are looking for it. So I want to thank you for your time today and um, just wish you all the best in your journey. 
Yeah. Thank you so much for, for having me. Yeah. Appreciate, appreciate the opportunity. Great. All right. We'll talk to you later. Just a second.